So how was the sermon? Oh, it was fantastic. It just left me so convicted that I need to be more I think I heard something. What was that? I don't know, but it was sound whenever I said Ma'am, ma'am. Excuse me, you can't say those types of things here. I can't say No, it's a family establishment. You can't say those types of things. Well, why does something beep every time I say H-O-L-Y? Probably because you shouldn't be saying it here. Okay, so I guess you think I'm gonna go to for saying and it's not like I'm a soul. Ma'am, please don't make me get the manager. Manager? Just cause I said You know what? Both of you, out. Oh, mom, not again. Don't you worry, honey. We're not going anywhere. H-O-L-Y. Well, this week we are beginning a, uh, a series called Four Letter Words, but they're probably different than the four letter words we're used to thinking of when we hear about four letter words. There are certain subjects that uh, we don't like to talk about. There are certain words that we try to avoid because we don't want to be offensive and we don't want to make things awkward. We don't want to get labeled and we don't want to be misunderstood. And so there are just certain things we don't talk about. We don't want people to feel uncomfortable. And culturally, we've become very uncomfortable with the thought that we might make someone uncomfortable. And so all kinds of things that we try to avoid speaking about. But there are countless articles online that suggest words or subjects you should avoid um, on the job. Things that you just shouldn't say, you shouldn't talk about in the workplace. There are all kinds of articles that deal with what you shouldn't say on a first date, words that you need to avoid on the first date. I came across a list of things that you shouldn't talk about on a first date, and um, they said among the phrases you want to avoid on a first date is avoid beginning any sentence with the following, um, my psychiatrist. Like whatever you're gonna say after that, don't just, (laughs) You don't want to start a sentence that way, or my workout routine, or my medication, or uh, my ex, or you never want to begin a conversation on a first date that begins with, um, I had this crazy dream last night, don't, you know, you don't want to go there. And then it has all kinds of things you shouldn't talk about. You shouldn't talk about your religious beliefs, your political affiliation, your feelings about body hair, all of that's uh, out, out of bounds. And then it said you shouldn't talk about any trophies or awards that you won before you were 21 years old. Like, those don't count. Uh, if, if you won the World Series, it's great. But you don't need to, you don't need to try to impress her with that. If, if it was before the age of 21, don't, don't play that card. And then, you know, they said don't give away any information that you may have discovered while stalking your date on social media. Like, that's, that's to be avoided as well. And all kinds of things that you don't want to talk about, all kinds of words you don't want to say. The problem, of course, is this, that when there are so many words you can't say and so many subjects you can't talk about, it makes it difficult to get to know somebody else. It makes it hard to to really know the person. So in an effort to make things comfortable, what we oftentimes sacrifice is um, relationship. Mm -mm. Things become impersonal. They become inauthentic. You don't talk about anything personally significant. It's not awkward, but it's also always on the surface, and as a result, you miss out on any real connection. I think that happens sometimes at church. That just as there are things that we don't talk about at work or maybe on dates, there's certain words, certain subjects we tend not to talk about at church or in Christian circles, at least not as much as we used to, because we are concerned about making sure everybody's comfortable and being socially acceptable, but as a result, we're missing out on what's what's real. So in this series called Four Letter Words, we're gonna talk about some words that can can make us a little bit uncomfortable. Hope that gets you excited about the next four weeks at church. But, but I hope you'll find it refreshing. I, I think it will be, I think it can be. Because there's something refreshing about coming to church and it's not fake, but it's real. And that we're gonna honestly talk about things even if they're uncomfortable. And, and there are certain things we would rather talk about than others. We'd rather talk about heaven than hell, and we'd rather talk about being found than being lost, and rather focus on being happy than being holy, and rather talk about being blessed than being called to obey, but, but we wanna talk about what the Bible talks about. And the, the word that I have uh, this week as we begin the series is the word fear. Now, fear might not seem like a four-letter word that we avoid using. A lot of us would say, well, I don't 
mind, you know, discussing my fears. It doesn't make me uncomfortable. Well, that's true, and we're going to see this in a minute, as long as it deals with physical safety. We tend to think of fear in terms of our physical safety, but there's this whole other set of internal fears that we, we rarely talk about with other people and, and often don't acknowledge even to ourselves. But the Bible talks a ton about fear. The Bible tells us to fear God that we should hold him in awe and reverence. The Bible tells us again and again to fear not, to don't be afraid. It's said that that's the most repeated command in all of scripture, don't be afraid. God wants you to be free from your fears. One of the things I, I wanna challenge you to do when you are living in fear, when you're experiencing fear, is to get used to reading the Psalms because the Psalms have a way of teaching us how to respond to fear. If you read through the Psalms, there's a pattern where the, the psalmist will acknowledge a fear but then acknowledge the bigness or the greatness or the power of God. And so what the Psalms will do as you read them is the, the Psalms will teach you to shift your focus from fear to, to faith. It'll teach you how to respond to your fears with, with the faith and a, and a peace that comes from knowing who God is. And so an example of that, Psalm 46. The psalmist says, God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. So we will not fear when earthquakes come and the mountains crumble into the sea. Let the oceans roar and foam. Let the mountains tremble as the waters surge. And then that psalm ends with reminding us that God is the God of angel armies who is always with us, always by our side. So Psalm 46 kind of gives us this picture of fear by telling us about earthquakes that shake and mountains that, that crumble. I, I've heard fear defined this way, that this equation equals fear. When, when we're in a situation where there's a heightened vulnerability and a diminished sense of power. When, when something happens, when we suddenly feel vulnerable, we suddenly feel exposed, it's not safe, and, and we don't have the power to change it, we don't have the power to control it or to do something different, the result is fear, a heightened sense of vulnerability and a diminished sense of power. And so there are, there are those fears that, that we are reluctant to talk about. Now, we'll talk about the ones in the physical world. We don't mind doing that, right? Like, just by show of hands, we don't, we're not afraid to do this. How, how many of you... Uh, the f thinking of phobias, a little bit of arachnophobia, a little, little fear of spiders. Raise your hand if you've got a fear of spiders. Yeah, it's okay. See, we don't mind that. We, there's no judgment in this room if you have the fear of spiders. A lot of, a lot of us are afraid of spiders, a little bit at least. Uh, what about acrophobia, fear of heights? Any, anybody fear of heights? A few of you up there? It's good to have you here. Yeah, so <laughs> not a lot of judgment, fear of heights. We, we get it. It's, it's, we don't mind claiming that one. Um, claustrophobia? Fear of confined spaces. You just are uncomfortable with confined spaces, okay? Uh, Pentrophobia, uh, fear of your mother-in-law. Anybody uh, <laughs> else? Like, like, seriously, though, it does feels good just to say it. Yeah, okay, I'm afraid. What do you want? So, like, we, we, have, we have these fears that we don't mind. We don't mind claiming. We don't mind acknowledging. I don't mind talking about those fears. But there are these other fears <laughs> that we don't talk about at all. I was at a leadership conference for a couple days this past week, and um, one morning for breakfast, I, I was sitting at a table with a, a group of leaders, and Bob Russell, the former senior pastor of this church, was at the table as well. He knew I was going to be preaching this sermon on fear. He was helping me out a little bit, so he, he had the table go around and say, each person say what they were most afraid of, or a moment in their life they were, they were most afraid. Well, no one was eager to participate. So he starts calling people by name, which was great. And, and so he, he's having them say a moment they were afraid or uh, what they're most afraid of. And here's what happened almost immediately is it became kind of this, um, oh, can you top this story? <laughs> Right? Like, well, there was this one time I was in a hotel and it caught on fire and we barely escaped out. There was this one time there was gunfire at my neighbor's room. I got, and and it, it became this moment of fear where they were in fear for their physical safety, but they made it. They made it. That's what fear quickly became about. And yet, for most of us, that's, that's not really what we're really most afraid of, right? Like, there's a whole other set of fears that we don't talk about, we don't share. Like the fear of rejection that most of us live with, with to one degree or another, that we have this fear that we'll be rejected. And so we keep our friends at arm's length. Or, or you keep your spouse or a significant other from getting too close. Or you carefully monitor social media to see how many likes you've got and to read the comments and wonder why a certain person hasn't liked a certain post. 
There's the, the fear of abandonment related to the fear of rejection. One of the most, I was reading this week about the most common nightmares we have, and one of the most top five most common nightmares that we have is that the a person, our significant other, will leave us for someone else, that we're just uh, afraid of being left, fear of abandonment. There's the fear of loneliness, that no one will want you and that you'll end up by yourself. We don't talk about the fear of failure, but, but significantly, <laughs> the fear of failure is what determines our lives. It, it, it's, what, it's what limits our relationships. It causes us to make or not make all kinds of decisions. I mean, we don't talk about it, but, I mean, you don't apply for the promotion because you're afraid you're, you're not going to get it, or you don't try out for the team, you're afraid you're not going to make it, or you don't ask the girl out on a date because you're afraid she's going to say no, and so, so we play it safe. Or, or someone says something uh, just the least bit critical to you. A, a spouse says something, it's a little bit critical, and immediately you're defensive and you're angry, and you start listing your successes because your fear of failure button just got pushed. Or there's the fear of defectiveness where deep down you feel like there might be something wrong with you and you're not sure how to fix it. And so you feel like you're walking around with this label called defective and you don't want anyone to see it. And so these areas in your life where it's not going so well, you, you, just, you, you just start avoiding them and you just focus on areas of your life where you feel like you're a little more capable. There's the, the fear of weakness or fear of being exposed Another of the top five nightmares that we have is um, being naked in public. And, and that nightmare relates to this fear of our vulnerabilities being found out, that people will see who we really are and what we really struggle with and what we really look like. And if that's something you've, you struggle with, if you've got this fear of weakness, then chances are you try to control situations and you try to manipulate people and you try to maintain the illusion as, as much as possible that you're in control. There's a fear of death, where you're constantly anxious about you or someone you love being diagnosed with cancer or getting in a car accident. We, we don't like the word death. We barely even say it in our culture. We'll, we'll say phrases like, well, they passed on, or they've gone ahead, or they've cro crossed the river, or they're singing in the eternal choir, or they've kicked the bucket, bought the farm, pushing up daisies, bit the big one, cast in the chips, all kinds of things. But we don't, we don't want to say death. And there's a lot of other fears we could talk about that would make us uncomfortable. Fear of intimacy. Fear of really being known by someone. There's fear of commitment. I'll make some people uncomfortable. How, how many years you've been dating her, bro? How many years? Yeah, you've got, you've got some fears that you need to deal with. And, and so we have these fears. We don't often acknowledge them as such to others or even to ourselves. I was thinking about some of the fears that I live with right now that in the past, these types of things, I wouldn't have labeled as fears, but that's what they are. Um, fears that I don't particularly want to talk about, but uh, like, like I have this fear right now of a, of a difficult conversation that I need to have with someone. And, you know, I've been putting it off. Um, I'm afraid of how he's going to respond. And I know God wants me to do it, but I'm scared. I've been scared to do it. Um, I, a fear that I have these days as I watch the news and such, I, I, I'm sometimes afraid for the world my kids are growing up in and their kids will grow up in, it's, it can scare me. Um, I, I'm afraid, just to be honest with you, I'm afraid almost, almost every day of failing as a husband and as a father. Uh, a lot of times I feel like I'm blowing it and it, and it scares me to death because I care deeply about being the, the husband and father God's called me to be. Uh, truthfully, I, if I'm honest, I'd tell you, I, I'm a little, like, <laughs> I'm a little afraid right now. Like, just right now. I'm, I'm just, this whole time, I've been a little scared. I, I, you know, I've done this enough that I, I know how to, I know how to pray my way through it, and I know the verses of Scripture that I need to remind myself of, and God's power, and God's strength, but, I mean, I don't know if you can see that, but that's, I mean, that's always there. That's, that's always there. You know, I, I it used to be that, uh, that I, I was, a f you know, I was, this would make me scared because, you know, fear of rejection, I think. Um, and I don't know really when it became more fear of f failure, but, but at some point I just started to realize, you know, what God, you know, there's just such, I, there's so much at stake, right? Like in this room, there's so much at stake. And I, I know that there are certain things, you know, that God is, is He's wanting to communicate to you. 
I know it's not an accident that some of you are here. I I know that some of you won't come back like this is it. And and that scares me because I don't want to mess that up. Uh, And and sometimes I'm just scared that I haven't prayed enough or I haven't prepared enough. Um, And I'm scared I'm going to say something that's going to push you away from God when I know know how much he's wanting to draw you to him. And so we've, we've got these fears that we live with, but we don't like to talk about. It just it seems safer to sit in the dark and be scared than to turn the lights on. But Psalm 46 says God is, is a refuge. He's a strength. Refuge is, is a, simply defined as a safe place to hide. That's God. It's a safe place to hide. That, that when, we are, when we are like this, he is our refuge and he is our strength. So when there's this heightened sense of vulnerability and a diminished sense of power, that God is where we run. Psalm 121 is not a very long psalm, but it really helps us um, shift our focus from fear to faith. It goes like this. I look up to the mountains. Does my help come from there? My help comes from the Lord who made the heavens and earth. He will not let you stumble. The one who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel never slumbers or sleeps. The Lord himself watches over you. The Lord stands beside you as your protective shade. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord keeps you from all harm and watches over your life. The Lord keeps watch over you as you come and go, both now and forevermore. Look up to God, Psalms 121 says, because he is there and he is watching you and he is your protective shade and he doesn't sleep and he doesn't slumber. Um, the winter before last was kind of uh, an especially cold winter around here, and we have um, this pond that you can see when you walk out the front door of our house, and the front the pond looked like it was frozen solid, and for years, my son, who's 11 now, I think he was nine at the time, my, my, my son has talked about walking across the frozen pond, like that's, that's been a mission that he has had in the back of his mind, and he'd make comments about it when we would pass it, and he'd say, I you know, I think, it, I think this is the time. I think I can walk across that pond. I think it's frozen enough. And, and he would say, I don't have to walk all the way across. I'll just walk to the middle and back. And, and my, my wife would hear these conversations and she was not happy about it. And, and, and um, she would explain to him that it wasn't safe and we didn't know how thick the ice was and the ice might crack. And, and um, she would tell my son, here's what's gonna happen. If the ice cracks and you fall in, and, and so hypothermia was talked about, I think gangrene may have been mentioned. But, you know, she's trying. She's trying. The day finally came when he comes and he says, Dad, I, I just, I keep thinking I have to do this. I feel like I have to cross the, the, the pond. I think it's frozen enough. And then he had a buddy with him, and they were just determined to do this. And I'm like, well, when do you want to do it, buddy? And he said, well, when will, when will mom be home? I'm like, yeah, that's the question. That is the question. <laughs> I don't, I don't even know how much time we have to work with. And so I went through some safety instructions, like what to do when you hear ice cracking and such. But here, here's a picture that, um, that we have. Yeah, it's a great idea. Um, what I want you to notice about this picture and what I was clear you know, to point out to my wife and later to the parents of my son's friends <laughs> was <laughs> that um, there's a rope attached. It's, actually, uh, it's not actually a rope. I don't have rope, but I have ratchet straps. So it's ratchet straps that are a- attached to them securely. I didn't tell them this, but it, they were short enough that they couldn't go too far. It was about four feet deep, I'm guessing. Uh, on the other end of the, that rope, what you can't see, what you can't see in that picture is on the other end of the rope is a adequately strong man, right? Like I'm capable, I, I think, of, of pulling a couple of nine-year-olds across a sketchy pond. And, and we came up with this fairly elaborate system that if the ice started to crack, they were to yell and go limp. That was the plan. Because in my mind, if you start running and stomping across a pond where the ice is cracking, it makes it worse. So I'm like, yell and then just go limp and I'll pull you to safety. (laughs) So that was the plan. That makes you feel better. It, It didn't really make my wife feel better, but it all worked out. It was frozen enough, clearly, and and they made it, got back in time. Here, here's what I, I want you to understand, that God as a father was never about um, getting his sons and daughters to avoid, to avoid being afraid. Uh, he put them in, in circumstances and situations where they were scared as a way to test their faith, to deepen their faith. As, as a father, God was never about saying, oh, you, just, you should just play it safe. 
Just avoid your fears at all costs. That he's watching and he's, he's ready to help. I, I was reading about some of the different ways that we respond to fear. These first two will be familiar to you, but I want to touch on them. One is fight. Um, and then we go into control mode. We're going to fix the situation, right? And, and sometimes that's good. Sometimes fear is a call to action. But then something happens where it becomes painfully clear that you have no control over something. Like you can't fix what needs to be fixed. And when that happens, fear can almost be overwhelming because you thought you were living under this illusion that you were in control. And so you didn't have a lot of fear because you thought, I've got this. And you never did, but you thought you did. And so cancer comes along. You can't fix cancer. And fear begins to consume. You, You realize you can't control your spouse's feelings or you can't control the declining business or you can't control your child's behavior and and all of a sudden you're in this place where you don't have control in the past you were able to fix and manipulate and control but now you are vulnerable and there is this diminished sense of power and you don't know what to do and and so you fight you become angry you're just an angry person we've talked about anger in this last uh series but a lot of anger comes from this struggles that we have with fear. We respond in anger when we're criticized because it it triggers that fear of failure button and we're ready to fight. We become angry when we're ignored by a friend or when we're rejected by a spouse because it triggers that fear of rejection and and no one's gonna treat us that way. Uh, we re- we're reminded of something traumatic that happened in the past that we can't control now. I mean, it happened in the past. There's nothing we can do about it now. And it, and it makes us just feel powerless. And, and we have this fear of feeling that way again. We have this fear of feeling powerless. And we just, we can't do anything about it. And so we, we just become angry. And we fight. Another way we deal with fear is flight, right? This is the fight or flight idea. We run away from it. We take off. We hide from it. So you're faced with your fears of rejection and failure and you, 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 you clam up. You're faced with a fear of commitment or a fear of intimacy and you just shut it down. And one of the primary ways we deal with fear is by avoidance, which works okay in the physical world, right? Like, so if you're afraid of flying, you don't fly. It's okay, you can kind of get away with that. If you're, if you're afraid of heights, you stay off the ladder and usually that's fine. You don't, you don't it's, a, it's not gonna affect your life too much. But when you're afraid of, of commitment, and so you avoid relationships, when you're afraid of failure, and so you avoid God's calling in your life, problem. That's a problem. Because these are the things that ultimately will give you life and will define who you are. But our tendency when we're afraid is oftentimes to, to run away. Uh, another way we deal with fear is, is to freeze. Instead of fight or flight, we, we freeze. We, in other words, it, it, we allow it to paralyze us. This is where a fear begins to consume us to the point where we lose perspective. And so other people might know a little bit about what you're struggling with, and they don't, they don't get it. Like, they don't understand how, how what you're struggling with or why this fear is so consuming but, but it has consumed you, and it's what you think about when you fall asleep at night or when you wake up in the morning. It's what you have nightmares about and, and you wake up to, and it, it, it just has robbed you of any kind of emotional energy. It robs you of peace. It robs you of joy. You just, you just freeze. And, and then, of course, the response that we have been called to as followers of Jesus is to have faith, that we put our faith in God. Jesus when he was um, getting ready to, to be arrested and killed, he's talking to his followers about what's gonna happen and how he's not gonna be with them anymore and they're scared, he can tell they're scared and so Jesus says to them, I- I'm gonna send a comforter, I'm gonna send the Holy Spirit. I'm not just gonna be with you, but he's gonna be in you. You have faith, you have faith in that. Now you look at that, <laughs> that list, fight, flight, freeze, fear, you might think, I don't like any of them. I don't like any of those. I, I, none of those really solve the problem. Well, those are your options. And you're gonna have to decide if you're gonna become angry and just become an angry person or if you're gonna put your faith in God. You're, you're gonna decide if you're gonna just hide and run away from it 
or if you're gonna put your faith in God. Now, you're gonna have to decide if you're gonna be, continue to just be frozen by it and lose perspective and just be robbed of the life that God wants you, to, or you're gonna put your faith in God. Those are your options. David says in Psalm 56, verse 11, I trust in God, so why should I be afraid? What can mortals do to me? It's, it's, it's rhetorical, right? Like, well, what are, you, what are you gonna do to me? You're gonna kill me? Because I'm gonna go spend eternity in paradise where there's no mourning or sadness or pain, no sickness. That's the perspective that faith allows us. Isaiah 41, verse 10, God says, don't be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. And this is what faith does. Faith takes our focus off of our fears and fixes our eyes on God. Let's put it this way, that our fears stand between us and God, but faith puts God between us and our fears. That's what faith does. It invites us. Um, it invites us to remember, the fear invites us to remember the, the faithfulness of God. One of my favorite pictures of what that looks like comes from, um, what faith in the midst of fear looks like, comes from a book called Sabbatical Journeys by Henry Nouwen. And he, he writes in this book about some friends of his who were trapeze artists and they, they traveled with a circus and they taught Henry about kind of the special relationship between the flyer and the catcher on the trapeze. And the, the flyer is the one that lets go and the catcher is the one, of course, that catches. And the, when the flyer is swinging high above the crowd on the trapeze, the moment comes where the, the flyer has to let go, right? It, it is an ultimate sense of vulnerability and a diminished sense of power. It's a helpless feeling. And the flyer arcs out into the air and his job is to reach out his arms or her arms and remain as still as possible. And they explained the flyer must never try to catch the catcher. You just, you just have to be still and wait to be caught. And, and that's our job here. When there is fear, just as God spoke to Moses and had the Red Sea in front of him, the Egyptian army come behind him and people are panicking and they're scared. And, and God says through Moses, be still, just watch. Be still and watch. And, and we have confidence in the catcher. And so we, we extend our arms and we wait for him to catch us. We have faith that he is watching, that he never sleeps and he never slumbers. We have faith that this life is just a breath and it's just a moment. So when you find yourself living with fear, then the invitation is to worship, to put your faith in God, to remember his power and his faithfulness to you. That's what we wanna do as we finish up. I'm gonna read the first four verses of Psalm 34. In fact, I'd like us to all read this out loud together here. So we'll read these verses out loud together and then we're gonna spend just a few minutes worshiping together and as we do, that the image I, I, I want to leave you with is, is just the image of flying through the air and wait, waiting to be caught by the catcher. And we put our confidence in God. So let's, let's read this together from Psalm 34. I will praise the Lord at all times. I will constantly speak his praises. I will boast only in the Lord. Let all who are helpless take heart. Come, let us tell of the Lord's greatness. Let us exalt his name together. I prayed to the Lord and he answered me. He freed me from all my fears. God, I know that's what you want to have happen in this place, that there are fears um, that we don't talk about, that we don't even admit to ourselves, but they're real. And, and for too long they have held us back and they have uh, defined our future and they've limited our relationships and, and, and we've allowed our fears to get between us and you, God. And today, God, we want to, to put our focus on you and we want faith to put you between us and our fears. And God, we don't wanna be a slave to fear. You haven't called us to that kind of life where we just, we're slaves to that feeling of fear. But God, you have called us to live as your sons and daughters where we know as your children that you are watching us and that you can be trusted to catch us. So God, in these next few moments, would you shift our eyes off of our fears and would you help us to focus them on you and would you give us the faith that we need? It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.